Thanks for joining us. We're here today with Sheriff-elect Ryan Palmer, who recently won his election against a longtime incumbent, Michael Chamberlain. Ryan, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to uh, to be here and to, to kind of reach out and be able to explain some things to people and, and touch base. Yeah, I think uh, the folks at Woodstock will be glad to hear from you and see what you have to say. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So welcome to our studio. We are in the former jail uh, and the building where your future office will be. That's, that's right. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your Vermont, your Vermont roots. Yeah. So I grew up in Windsor. Uh, I went to school, Windsor High School, played football there. I, all my family basically is in the area. So I started my law enforcement career in Claremont, uh, ended up, most of my time was in, in Windsor as a as a detective. I own some of my own businesses and really just I'm a Windsor County kid. So the big drive for me on this was this is my home and I want to make it a, a better place, you know. And you also had some military experience, is that right? I did. I went to, uh, I, in 2005, which would have been the year I would have graduated high school, I joined the United States Air Force Reserve out of Chicopee, Massachusetts, Westover. was with them for, I believe, five years, deployed to Iraq in 2008 into 2009, came back, uh, ended up switching units to the Connecticut Air National Guard and deployed to Afghanistan in 11 into 12. So 10 years under my belt there, two combat deployments. When did your law enforcement experience begin? Well, so interesting story. Uh, I always wanted to be in uniform service. I don't know what it was, whether it was watching, you know, old John Wayne movies with my grandmother or, you know, G.I. Joe or what have you. But it started at a very young age. I remember I have a, actually a, a letter on my wall, a framed letter that I got when I was about five years old from some lieutenant colonel in, in National Guard recruiting that my grandmother took me to an event that they were having at the Windsor Armory at the time, and I got her to fill out the form for me and send it in to, to enlist, you know, or to, to ask for information. Of course, I was five years old. So I got this funny letter back, hey, you know, thanks for your interest. We'll see you in 15 years type thing. Uh, so that was kind of just a, a funny little you know, joke there. But really it took off when I was about 16 years old. A neighbor of mine was a police officer in Windsor. And I asked to do a ride along one time. I was DJing a school dance, and I said, and he had shown up. He said, "Hey, let me do a ride along." So I was basically hooked from there. So I've really been around law enforcement since I was 16 years old. I spent a lot of time in police cars with riding around with guys and, and learning, kind of learning the ropes before I could even be a police officer. Why did you choose to run for sheriff of Windsor County? Sure, uh, a multitude of reasons. The biggest catalyst, I would say, for me was what I view as a need for change on the more macro level of Vermont law enforcement, right? Um, we were having this increasing need for professional law enforcement services, right? Whether we'd like to admit it or not, Vermont is changing, sometimes for the good, sometimes for not so good and questionable. I mean, we've seen... Uh, I think it's pretty obvious you see this rise in violent crime. Obviously, addiction has been an issue for 20-plus years now, 25 years, really, if you if you break it down. I mean, addiction has always been an issue, but what we're seeing with, with opioids and now stimulants are coming back into the fold, which is brings a whole other uh, level to, the, to the, the addiction game. But changing the way one... We have this countywide law enforcement agency that, in my opinion, was wholly focused on just revenue generation through traffic citations, these type of things. Uh, and we can get into all the funding mechanisms. I'm sure you'll ask about that down the road. But for me, it was about making a real impactful change. You know, yeah, you can do that at, you know, first line, second line level. But becoming a department head on a countywide agency, and I had seen the potential. I mean, some of my mentors early on had worked for the sheriff's department on and off. So this is kind of an agency I've been studying for 20 years, if that makes sense. And seeing that this agency has such potential 
to provide a needed service to the people in Vermont right now. You know, when you look at the Vermont State Police, their manning, uh, their ability to, to, to respond to calls, and just the increasing demand on police services in some of these small towns that have not had police, right? You can take a look around this area, Pomfort, Barnard, you know, Stockbridge, all these small towns, Reading, Plymouth, you know, more and more things are going on in these places. And Vermont State Police, who has traditionally been the law enforcement for those areas, just doesn't have the ability to respond in an effective manner or what I would deem would be an effective manner at this point. So I see the potential in this agency. Uh, I'm excited about every day. You know, I'm just getting off topic, but I'm excited to be the next sheriff and to lead this agency into the future. We've got a great team down there. Uh, people are ready for the change. People are motivated to be involved and, and to help push this thing forward. And that was, so those things are the, some of the biggest catalysts. The need for change, the faith in myself that I could bring the vision and the change to the agency uh, and make an impact on Windsor County in a positive light. And you challenged an incumbent who's been in this role since, I think, 1978, which is the year I was born. <laughs> Correct, yeah. So the sheriff, current sheriff, Sheriff Chamberlain, was first elected in 1978, took a little break, 94 to 99, Bill Hines came in, and he's been back in that role since 99. So essentially, by all uh, intents and purposes, is a 40-year incumbent. And so what did you think your chances were coming into this? And were you surprised at all on election night? Well, like Tiger Woods said before he got into the Masters this year, or the British Open, I think it was, uh, I, don't, I didn't enter a tournament I didn't expect to compete or to win. And I knew that I had a very solid plan. I knew that the political landscape was set up in my favor. Uh, and I knew that I was going to outwork and outspend these guys. Uh, and so I never, um, it might sound cocky or arrogant, but I, I had a pretty good feeling I'd be in this seat right now um, because I had faith in my plan and the message. And it was just time for change. And I, I, you know, the voters in Windsor County obviously agreed with me there. Mm -hmm. So when you assume your new role in February, will will there be turnover in staff and deputies? Uh, we have to restaff the office. How does that work? No, I don't think I don't think there's there, there's going to be some changeover that you would expect, uh, but nothing of significance. So. You know, obviously it's a strange landscape right now for hiring law enforcement. You know, when I got in the job, you'd have 20 people for one position, you know, vying for one position. In the generation before me, you might have 300 people vying for one position. Um, and now we have 300 positions and one person putting in for it. But I'm very, and that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but I'm very confident in our ability to hire. I've got, you know, nine interviews scheduled in the next week or two that we're, you know, next Saturday that we'll, we'll be interviewing nine people that want to come work for us. So I'm confident in the product that, that we're putting forward, that people will be attracted to, to what we're doing. Um, the changeover is going to be minimal. Some folks that are, were are ready for a change themselves, but overall, I think that it's, there's going to be fairly significant amount of consistency going forward, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay. So we're not, we're not blowing it up and tearing it down and, and rebuilding it. Um, there's some good parts and pieces there. Uh, it's got good bones, so to speak, and there's, I, I'm, I inherited a very good team. All right, good to hear. For those who don't really understand what the role of the sheriff is, can you explain that a little, what the constitutional duties sure. are and what additional sure. um, obligations they take on? Well, if you don't understand the role in the, as a sheriff in Vermont, uh, don't feel alone because it's a very convoluted, I would say it's a very complex uh, landscape. Sheriffs in Vermont are, again, they're, they're what we call a constitutional office. They're appointed by statute, right? Or they're 
there in the statute. We're required to do a couple things by law. Serve what's called civil process, so paperwork from attorneys, evictions, writs, all these type of things, you know, seizing property, if somebody needs to repo it, those uh, transport, uh, transportation of prisoners to and from jail and court, uh, mental health watches for those type of things. But there's this caveat where, as law enforcement officers, we can contract out our services. So stay with me on this. Vermont, unlike many other states in the nation, doesn't have a real strong county form of government. In fact, it's almost non-existent when you compare it to, say, a Florida or California or, or somewhere else that has, you know, the county is a, is a big deal. So that means that there's not much of a county funding mechanism. There's a little bit, and people don't know that, some of your state taxes go to, to fund the county. Now, the state in Windsor County, the state of Vermont, pays my base salary. It pays the salary of two what we call state paid deputies for obvious reasons. Their job is kind of directed from the state's attorneys and sheriff's office in Montpelier. And they dictate a little bit about what these guys do. Primarily, prisoner transport is their number one focus. Now, break that down a little bit. The county provides the sheriff's department around $228,000 a year, I think is where it was at last year. And a big chunk of that pays for some office staff downstairs. Uh, it also pays, you know, some insurance, some some different miscellaneous bills. But uh, I believe there's a, a Supreme Court decision in Vermont, Stowe v. Lamoille, that said that the county cannot pay for law enforcement services. So the county can pay for some of these administrative fees and training, these type of things. So, again, it adds this layer of complexity to an already kind of wonky situation. So in the, I believe in the 1970s, the legislature decided that, hey, the sheriffs are going to be able to contract their services out. And since we can't pay them anything, at the, at the time, the, the state wasn't really paying much, and guys were driving their own cars. Uh, you know, very much uh, something you see out of a movie, you know. And they put in this caveat that the sheriffs could contract out services and take a 5% administrative fee. So, you know, on a $200,000 contract, the sheriff would get taken $10,000 as part of his administrative fee. We're using big numbers. Mm -hmm. So that, of course, has led to some questions from people over time. Well, is that, is that legitimate? You know, how is that being used? But, you know, the, the sheriff's departments as is could not survive without contractual services and one of the issues i had during my campaign was how were they being used i talked a lot about policing for profit and what we had seen in windsor county at the time was that some small towns i mean you take plymouth and bridgewater everyone in woodstock knows about bridgewater right mm -hmm. to add another level of complexity to this traffic citations traffic tickets your speeding ticket a large portion of that for many, many years, about 87.5%, was returned to the town. So a $100 ticket, $87.50 went back to the town that was written in. So what we had seen for many, many years is these small towns would contract the sheriff's department to be just speed enforcement. Mm -hmm. And the sole focus was writing tickets to pay to cover the sheriff's department to sit there and write tickets. And backing up, why the contractual law enforcement, you know, why the town, one, wanted that, is hey, it, it covered it, made your, lowered your taxes or kept your taxes from going up. Uh, but unlike, say, a municipal police department or like Woodstock, where Chief Bush goes, he puts together a budget, says, hey, I have six officers or eight officers, they each cost me, you know, $125,000, and presents a budget to the town. So every year, July 1, boom, money drops into his budget. 
in theory, it actually comes in over time, but July 1, the new budget hits, right? It doesn't happen with the Sheriff's Department. Again, the state pays my base salary, pays for two deputies, state salaries, um, and there's a little bit of funding from the county. So if you want it to be more and you want to provide law enforcement service to, say, Bridgewater, I can't, I don't have any money or there's no funding mechanism. I can't just stick somebody out there like you would see maybe in some of these other places where there's more cohesive county government. So it's become a contractual law enforcement agency, which is okay. There's been some negative light shed on that, but it works well. It does work well in other states. I mean, L.A. County Sheriff's, the biggest sheriff's department in the country, does contractual law enforcement. I mean, I think they cover Compton and several other towns where our cities in California under a contractual basis. Florida does it all the time. They also deal with, you know, the unincorporated parts. But what, so I don't necessarily think that's the worst scenario, but what is the, what is the goal? What is the focus? And for me, the focus is, is about shifting from, in my campaign, I talk about this a lot, from policing for profit to providing professional service, right? And that's, that's where I want to get away from, hey, we're, we're going to be more than just a stream of revenue for a town. We're not just going to write tickets. And again, traffic enforcement is part of public safety. Obviously, I mean, we've all seen crazy drivers and these type of things, but it shouldn't be the sole focus of a law enforcement agency, a countywide law enforcement agency. For me, there's so many other issues that we need to to, to focus on. I mean, you look at towns like Springfield and, and Hartford, a fair amount of, of violent crime, you know, increase in violent crime. And we've even seen it here in Woodstock where things that we never thought possible are happening. Addictions running rampant. So my focus, even though we're contractual law enforcement agency and, uh, and we have to have contracts with towns to pay for our service, the product that we're selling will be different. And I'm already working very hard to change that culture within the department and change the direction, the ethos, the doctrine to something that resembles a, a modern professional law enforcement agency that people want. Mm -hmm. So what types of contracts do you envision entering into and how will you execute those differently? Yeah, so, I mean, we're already, we're in, we're in the, the heat of budget season right now, right? Budgets work, you know, sometime starting in maybe October, through about February, towns will work on their, their budgets. They'll be voted on in March at town meeting, and then they'll take effect in July. So right now, I've met with, I've met with or am meeting with every town in the county that doesn't have law enforcement service that we either contract with or, have, or will be contracting with. And one part of that conversation is, hey, we need a certain level of funding here from you. But the service that we're going to provide is going to be exponentially better. My goal is to split up the county into patrol zones, sectors, whatever you want to call it, and be able to fill that void that's kind of left by state police's manning and cultural direction issues that we are going to be the small town police for these places that can't afford their own police departments. And when I say that, I'm not talking about being some occupying force that's there, you know, just sitting on the side of Route 4, stopping everybody going skiing. And again, I'm not trying to minimize the dangers of, of you know, this careless and negligent driving that we're seeing, speeding, all those. I'm not trying to minimize that. But again, there's a lot more to law enforcement. So being out of the car, you know, changing, first of all, changing the scope of the contract. We will be your police in each town's a little, the price is kind of each, is different for each town based off, you know, calls for service and, and how much they can afford. And so we're, we're working through that, figuring that out on each of these places. But letting people know that we will be the professional law enforcement agency that you're looking for, but also with a small town feel. I mean, a big thing for me is getting out of the car, stopping and having conversations with people, right? There's so much discourse and, and divisiveness in, in the country right now. I mean, you can't open your phone or turn on a TV without uh, just anger and divisiveness. So for me, a lot of the way to fix that is just connecting with people on a personal level, stopping in the local 
gas station, stopping in the local bakery or the deli or the restaurant, stopping in the, the, the garage, you know, getting out, talking to people, having conversations with real people. Um, schools, being involved in schools, whether it's formally or informally, is a big thing for me. One, from a relationship building standpoint, right? You have to interact with people and tear down these walls. And I'm sure that you'll, you'll ask some questions about that. But, you know, also the safety and security of these schools. I mean, we don't, we're not going to touch on, on all the issues there. But, I mean, again, turn on your TV, turn on your phone, and you see um, it's not the world that maybe we grew up in. So being a mentor, a protector, a guardian, to these young children out there is very important to me. Um, so just shifting this focus, again, it's this cultural shift in the agency away from strictly traffic enforcement to pay for traffic enforcement to being that that cross between, you know, Andy Griffin and a modern professional law enforcement agency, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Are there some contractual arrangements from the previous uh, sheriff's department that you will won't continue or that will be drastically changed. I don't know. I guess it's it's how do you how do you describe drastically um, the services that we're offering, the product that we're selling is different. And the contracts are the idea that hey, it's going to cost you this much, and and you're going to be part of you know, a bigger, for me, it's, and it's shifting from this idea of outputs to outcomes, not, Hey, we're here for four hours from noon to four, two days a week. And it costs you this much. And we're going to write this many tickets to, it's going to cost you this much, but we are going to try to patrol your town on a somewhat regular basis. Because again, I have one car in a sector is the idea that we're going to be bouncing around and Hey, it might not be four hours at a time, but you'll see a car come through. You'll see the my folks interact with the public. We'll be community problem solvers. One of the issues that I hear from a lot of these folks in small towns is that I have some sort of problem, whether it's a drug house, whether it's a neighbor dispute, whether it's uh, you know a troubled kid, whatever it is. I mean, pick every town's got its issues, right? And instead of saying, "Hey, we're sitting on Route Four writing tickets," being that conduit for people to get help, whatever that help looks like, whether it's us, you know, arresting a bad guy, or it's us directing somebody to social services that need help, or it's just having a conversation and a coffee with somebody because that can go a long ways. One of my campaign promises was to bring on a social worker slash victims advocate. So we're working on the logistics of that now, but I would think Sometime, probably in the summer, we'll have that. Again, I take office February 1st, but I think my goal is sometime in the summer to have that kind of hashed out. Um, there's a couple different avenues that we can take. So I think it's finding the thing that works the best for us right now. But having a person on staff, and I'm sure people are sick about hearing about my campaign, but there's this three-prong approach that I touted. One, being involved with at-risk youth, youth just in general, but, but being a mentor, guiding children, uh, kids away from nonsense, right? Trying to help them change the trajectory of their lives to be productive citizens, be mentors, guides, all that. But the second part was um, being more involved with social services, putting a social worker on board, those type of things. Because again, we deal with people at their worst. We're constantly dealing with people. But a good chunk of things that we deal with are not necessarily criminal in nature. Right. It's not a bank robbery, but it could be a neighbor dispute or it could be, you know, a kid's acting up, but they live in a home where they they don't eat. You know, I mean, food insecurity is a big thing in this uh, this day and age. So connecting people with resources to help them, getting people help that need help, but also being trained and empathetic and understanding how to get people help. Right. We're not just there to arrest everybody. We're there at the end of the day kind of my mission statement is make the world a better place. We don't need it, we don't need it to say all these different fancy words. Make the world a better place. Is what we're doing making the world a better place. So that's a big portion of it for me. And the third is, is proactive law enforcement. That looks 
that looks different for different people, different places, but being out there, again, making the world a better place, targeting people that are victimizing society. You know, if you want to be up here and you want to be a bad guy, so to speak, and, and that looks like different things, but if you want to be here victimizing society, you're going to deal with this. You know, being out, stopping car, you know, if, if you have an issue, you know, Bridgewater still has some issues with speed. So, okay, that's part of the community problem solving. You know, again, if you're you're in a place and, and you've got a, a drug house, so to, you know, set up, so to speak, well, we need to address that, not just write tickets. So that's part of, you know, that's kind of the, the overall, I would say, quick view, but I think I just spent 20 minutes running my that's gums a, about okay. it, you know. Make my job easier. Yeah. Um, so that social service, social work component, it, would that be unique or are other sheriff's departments around the state doing similar things like that? I don't know about other sheriff's departments, but uh, Vermont State Police uh, has done a pretty good job with that, having onboard social workers. Uh, many of the agencies in the county contract with HCRS and have um, social workers part of their you know, tool belt, so to speak. Uh, initially, I thought I would like to employ the person directly, but I think we'll investigate some other partnerships and and see where that goes. But it's a it's a wonderful asset to have somebody that that's their sole focus, and I think that that will be uh, a huge change for the the county. And yeah. Some of these underserved areas. I mean, let's face it: if you're up in Bethel or Rochester or or Plymouth or something, it's not like you have the same access to services that you do in Springfield or mm -hmm. or Hartford, right? So. Bringing services to people that need it is, is a big deal. Yeah, we could certainly use more of that. Yeah. Getting getting back into the nuts and bolts, mm -hmm. when you take over in February, will you have to be buying new equipment? Will you just be assuming taking over the, the vehicles, the equipment? Yeah, so, uniforms? So, I, so so look at it similar to a CEO coming back, you know, or a CEO taking over a company, right? You're, de you're changing out the department head, but nothing. I mean, okay, now it's... It's not Mike's agency anymore. It's mine. And that's about all that changes. You know, whatever debt you incur, whatever assets you incur, uh, you know, uh, employees, all that type of thing, you basically, it's yours now. Not yours, but you know what I'm saying. You're, yeah. you're responsible for it. So, um, yes, there's going to be some scaling up just because we're taking on, I suspect we'll have four more, four or five more contract towns. Uh, which kind of rounds out the, the rest of the county. So there'll be more work, and we'll probably need some more equipment and those type of things, but we're financially in, in a good place for that. And my understanding is that state law allows sheriffs to basically take 5% of contractual the yeah. money that comes in on contracts as part of your salary. Correct. So That's common practice. That is common practice, and again, it was put in place because... Well, the sheriffs weren't making enough back then. Um, I think you take a look at it now and go, okay, you're taking over responsibility. You're the chief law enforcement officer for that town. Uh, and let's say it's a big contract, $200,000. We'll just throw that number out there. Uh, you know, that entitles the sheriff to ten grand a year um, to be the chief law enforcement officer for that town. Which you, when you when you peel that back and go okay you're not paying for a full department head at eighty to one hundred twenty thousand um, dollars, and the sheriff incurs a lot of liability statutorily the sheriff is liable for the actions of his deputies. So, I it sounds a little funky at first, but I think based off the way things are funded now I don't know that it's unreasonable to think that the sheriff is going to take. Um, or not take. I mean, they're they're statutorily. It's what they're they're owed in a way. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that that's the worst thing. I think what is the purpose and the direction of the department is really when I get into that prop, you know, policing for profit model. Uh, you know, compensating a department head for the work they're doing. I don't know that that's the issue. Um, it can be. I mean, you know, if, if you're focused solely focused on only making money for yourself and your family, that becomes an issue. Correct, but you know the right intentions and in, in taking care of a you know compensating an apartment head fairly, I think is is not a huge issue. And you mentioned family. I I learned recently that it's been common practice around the state that sheriff's departments 
entire family members. Nothing inherently bad about that, but it might raise questions from citizens and residents. Do you have any plans to do anything like that? Well, you said there's nothing inherently bad, right? But I have a hard time finding something inherently good also in that practice. Again, I don't think it's necessarily been nefarious, but let's just put it this way. My mom's not going to be my secretary, right? And I don't think that that is something that, it doesn't pass the smell test with a lot of people, regardless of whether it's working or not working. Um, but no, that's, uh, that's not on the, the agenda to start hiring family for, for these positions. And it sounds like you, you're doing some interviews, so you have interest in some of the positions. A huge, huge amount of interest, uh, and I'm thankful for that, right? I think some of that interest is generated from, hey, we're, we're trying to change the way rural law enforcement is done in Vermont. And, you know, I'm a little bit younger than maybe the average department head, and I've still got a lot of gas in the tank. I'm excited. Every day I'm waking up and I'm excited about this. And I'm working on things every day. Again, I don't take office till February 1st, but basically November 9th, it's been, I've been running. So, you know, I think that brings some, some attention in, you know, not that I'm trying to say I'm one of these, you know, visionary CEOs or anything, but people want to work for something exciting. I think we're building something exciting that people want to be a part of. And so I'm not worried about staffing issues. I've heard anecdotally that state police in particular have had a hard time recruiting. And part of the reason they cite is that fewer people want to get into law enforcement because there's there have been these growing tensions between citizenry and law enforcement. And they feel like they're not appreciated, that they're not wanted, and they just don't want the hassle of like being in that position. So there's multiple layers of this onion to peel back, right? Overall, have we taken a hit? And this is nothing. So we've seen the defund the police movement over the last, whatever it's been, five, six years, right? But this is nothing new. This is something that's been brewing for 10, 15, 20 years, where interest has slowly decreased in law enforcement. Now, obviously, over the last several years, there's been a huge decrease. Again, people take a look at it and go, well, I don't want to be that guy on the news. I don't want to be, you know, in very few jobs, if you screw up, could it, one, cost somebody their freedom, or two, cost somebody their life, including your own? And then the liability that comes with that, both criminally and civilly. But there's still a lot of great people out there that want to serve their community. And I think we're seeing the pendulum slowly swing back to where people are going, you know what, if not me, then who? So anyone out there listening, if you even have the slightest inkling that, that maybe you want to serve, you want to be part of, of you know, the greater law enforcement community, reach out. There's a lot of great places hiring. Yes, state police is having a, a tough time. Uh, but, you know, there's some good local agencies that, you know, would love to pick you up and you can make a difference. Mm -hmm. So for me, and I guess the second part of your question was, well, how am I going to fix that? It goes back to this conversation, this one-on-one -on -one personal interaction. If you're driving around, you never get out of your car, you get a dirty look on your face all day, like who's going to want to approach you? So getting out of the vehicle, being involved in the community. At the end of the day, it's a lot easier to be mad at somebody on the internet or somebody you see you've never met, right? But when you know somebody and know who they are as a person, and likewise, me as, as providing police service, if I know you as a person and, and humanize you, you know, again, it's about humanizing each other. So being part of the community, integrating ourselves in the community so we're, we're this integral part. We are part of the community, not, again, some occupying force. So the short answer to that is, is getting out there and being part of our community, building conversations. And there's a lot of different ways we're going to do that, but I think that kind of think that kind of answers your question. Right? Yeah. Along a similar track, there have been efforts in Montpelier recently to end qualified immunity mm -hmm. for law enforcement. 
they never talk about any qualified immunity for legislatures, though. Or I, I think they? that I think that might be on the table. I think they're they're realizing that well, why should why should anyone have qualified immunity because it mm -hmm. applies to state officials. So why focus just on law enforcement? Well, a qualified immunity is a bit of a buzzword, and it's used by detractors in a way that it makes it sound like police officers can never be held liable, either civilly or criminally. But we know that that's not true, right? We've seen police officers be held liable both civilly and criminally throughout history. I mean, there's federal law that allows a police officer if they violate somebody's civil rights. Qualified immunity is, is something that's been used in the defund the police movement. It's been misrepresented and it's been used in a targeted political way to achieve this agenda of, of destroying law enforcement in America. And again, I think there's two different tracks on the defund the movement. One that's legitimately people want evolution in our career field, and I'm one of those people, and that's why I'm working hard to evolve our career field. Um, but there's also this, I think, a more nefarious side that, that uses misinformation, disinformation. And the qualified immunity debate is really about disinformation. If you're a police officer and you violate somebody's civil rights, you can be held liable. If you're a police officer and you commit a crime, you can be held liable. And that's the bottom line, right? Now, does qualified immunity protect you from some frivolous lawsuits? Yes, that's what it does. Um, but I think this conversation, the qualified immunity conversation is just about pushing political agendas. It really is going to have no real bearing on anything other than it's going to make cops not want to be cops even more, but it's not going to make it a safer community. It's not going to really change anything with police misconduct um, or holding police more accountable. Um, it might just bog up the system more. But do not be fooled that police officers cannot be held accountable. Again, it's misinformation. It's, 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 in fact, I would call it outright lies. But police officers can and do uh, get held accountable in this country all the time. Are there other ways of addressing certain problems that might arise in the course of law enforcement that sometimes lead to these debates about qualified immunity in terms of um, police officers conducting themselves and doing their job the right way. I mean, there's what more than a million law enforcement officers in the country. Mm -hmm. As with any profession, there are going to be people who aren't good at their jobs. And it doesn't say anything about the profession or sure. the ones that are doing their jobs well. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess what I'm asking, are, are more resources needed for, for training, for integrating law enforcement with the people they're serving um, and also I mean we have to acknowledge that like teachers law enforcement often finds themselves in situations where they're effectively having to be social workers and they're dealing with problems that that are being exacerbated by social forces beyond their control right so you're often put into situations where it's almost like you can't win correct so what else could be done other than pouring lots, lots of money into training? And yeah, and so money can't always fix problems, right, if, especially if it's not spent well. So when you peel back officer mm -hmm. or police misconduct, you'll find that um, the amount of substantiated complaints against law enforcement are much lower than even other professions. I mean, compare it to medical malpractice and these type of things, I think you'll find that's much lower. And maybe I'm out of turn, but I'm, I've seen some studies in that. I can't cite it right now, but but I think if you look at, well, why does police misconduct, why do we think there's so much of it? And a lot of that is because it is very high profile. When you see a case like George Floyd, we'll use for example, um, it is very, very high profile. But you think about the number of police officers that are out there every day doing a good job. And then you compare it to one or two instances. You know, so now that being said, there's lots of room for improvement in our, in our profession, right? Um, and I think some of that is tearing down some of these walls that we've 
that for whatever reason in our society we we've built kind of these walls between the police and in our communities and in certain places but i dare say in woodstock vermont most of the locals know their their police department right and we've got to just communicate with each other we've got to again it's about the humanization get away from dehumanizing each other and go back to humanizing this is a real person sitting across the table from me um, training a big part of why I want to be a sheriff is building better cops being creative on training but pushing training forward you can't do this job and not you know you can't do this job well and only meet the minimum requirements we really have to push hard and also there's a you have to have a cultural change at the top or cultural accountability we'll say your department head has to have expectations for their department right again it's another big part of who who I am as a police officer and what I want to be and what my want my department to be um, so there's there's uh, many ways that we need to fix this and address this but oftentimes the police get blamed for a lot of things that are out completely out of our control you know the mental health system in, in this country is uh, probably not where it should be for you know the richest nation in the world our education system is rough you know there's a lot of places there's a lot of great places and I'm not knocking teachers but there's places that education is really really a tough place to be right now um, addiction and substance use is through the roof so there's all these things that kind of fall on our lap and sometimes there as you said there are no win situations um, and with obviously this advent of social media and how intrusive that is in our lives I mean everybody has an opinion and for the whole world to see and oftentimes those opinions aren't aren't right you know or there or, or again we look at the amount of misinformation and disinformation that when you talk on this larger picture about foreign nations meddling in our elections all these other things misinformation and disinformation is a big issue right now in this country and some of that is on the, the police side. You know, again, we'll, we'll take the, the Brittany Griner situation right now. Uh, get on your phone. You'll see there's two separate factions, right? That, and the facts are somewhere in the middle. And people are angry about this or people are happy. And, you know, so, so working, another part is having a good social media platform, having a good website reaching out to folks working with a couple of our papers to have maybe a newsletter but opening that chain of communication to the public and I won't say controlling the narrative that sounds maybe like it, it's nefarious but getting out there and getting the truth out in people's hands and that can diffuse a lot of situations so you plan on devoting part of your budget to social media to public outreach yeah I mean and it doesn't have to be you know, I built my own website. I run social media for, you know, for myself. and some, So we don't have that now for Windsor County Sheriff's Department. Kind of a day one thing, week one thing is to set up a website, social media, these type of things. Because it just, it, it's a way we communicate now. And I think open and honest communication with the public is a really big key to reestablishing or building trust within the community. You know, having a way for the to be contacted very easily um, makes sense to me. I mean, I don't know, you know, you're a citizen. Don't you think that that's the way that a police department should should go in this day and age? You know, I mean, it makes sense yeah. to me. Sure. And in terms of building trust, in a hypothetical scenario in the future, if one of your deputies does something that the public perceives as misconduct, mm -hmm. how would you address that internally and how would you handle that? Again, is it perceived misconduct or is it misconduct? So we have to evaluate. Let's, for, for the sake of this argument, not argument. For let's say it's misconduct. Is, let's say it's misconduct. It's misconduct. Yeah. Uh, and misconduct comes in a lot of different forms, right? Uh, accountability is going to be key with me. And that's a word, you know, it's a, it's a buzzword. Again, what is accountability? But making sure that we have a good internal affairs process, 
a good complaint procedure um, and that we thoroughly investigate and, and adjudicate these things. And now if it's something small, fix the problem. You know, if it's something larger than, um, you know, national best practice is to have a, a third party, you know, for a smaller agency like this, have a third party come in and investigate that. And if that's what needs to happen, it's, it's what needs to happen. But again, I want my people out there doing the right thing for the right reason at the right time, you know, but we're human and humans make mistakes. So evaluating that mistake and figuring out the right course of action and, and the right course of action is not always taking somebody's head off, right? Um, and sometimes we do things as police officers that are the right thing, but they aren't always perceived well. And so making sure, and the same token that I do have my people's back when they do something that's right, but maybe they're going to get some heat for it, right? As an elected official, department head, that's that's for me to take on that burden now. But if somebody's doing something wrong, we're going to correct it. And whether that's something very minute or if it's something much larger that somebody gets indicted or, or charged or held accountable criminally, that's the way it's going to be. Things aren't going to be swept under the rug. Uh, again, I think it's it's evaluating those mistakes and pushing forward, but having you know good practices in place. Mm -hmm. How big will your department be? Will it, I mean, how many how many employees are there now? And and do you, yeah, I you think there's that? about I think what we'll see is about fourteen now, mm -hmm. and I would say it's going to be twenty twenty three. 25 maybe with part-time folks just because I'm expecting kind of a busy construction season um, we're taking on some more towns so I would say in the next couple of years you'll see it you know be in the neighborhood of 25 mm -hmm. folks you know I don't see it expanding to 100 but I could see that the 20 to 25 mark is um, would make sense you mentioned you're taking on some new towns mm -hmm. can you say what towns those are well nothing's for certain now but um you know i think places like bethel you know that conversation bethel stockbridge weston heartland mm -hmm. um and that just about rounds out the county um compared you know we have all the other towns that we work you know so basically everything that's not south royalton norwich windsor hartford springfield chester or Ludlow or Weathersfield, uh, everyone else we're we're in contact with and working to to be their police. And even some of those other places, hey, can we help supplement you if you're in a bad way? Mm -hmm. So, so those towns that currently aren't being served by the Windsor County Sheriff's Department, do they have their own police? They do not. Are they being served by state police? Their state police uh, is in, would is kind of the default. Yeah. Uh, so you're seeing you know a town like Heartland has a contract for extra patrol service with the state police where they pay extra for the state police to essentially come in on overtime and in patrol. Mm -hmm. That has not really been happening. So they need to reevaluate, you know, they're reevaluating their needs and, and what they're going to do going forward. And I, I envision us being part of that solution. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, state police is kind of the on-call folks for most of those towns. And I'm hoping... Going in this next budget, you know, July, that we'll be able to provide calls for service response 16, 18, 20 hours a day. I'm hoping to have a night shift and a day shift. And mm -hmm. I think the way sh things are shaking up, that we can we can get there. Um, you know, but the goal is eventually to be to be that small town policing for for the small towns. What What do you think will be your, the biggest challenges for the department going forward? Um, we mentioned crime on the rise in some in some parts. Uh, yeah, drug crime. What's going to be the biggest challenges for me internally with the department? You know, managing a department, or do you mean what's the the for law enforcement in general, and right. in particular, kind of, what's the landscape? How, out yeah, there, what's the landscape, and, and what uh -huh. what are you concerned that your department will be facing going forward? Violent crime and addiction. You know, Burlington just had another murder. You're seeing shootings on the rise. 
Um, for me, I think two things are driving that. Um, one, you know, in Burlington, it was defund the police completely backfire. And so this lack of law enforcement presence throughout the state. But again, it's a changing landscape, it's a changing dynamic in Vermont. We've got a lot of people coming from other places, you know, whether it's through COVID or all these different things. You know, Vermont's kind of a growing population, but we're seeing a, a growing criminal element. Um, we've dealt with opiate addiction has been kind of the, in the forefront of the, the drug issue in the state for many years now. But what we're seeing now is an uptick in stimulants, whether it's methamphetamine, crack cocaine, even bath salts to a certain extent, but meth and crack. And that's bad. It's a much different high. It's a much different reaction. People become more violent and unpredictable on stimulants. So we're seeing some of that. So those two things, the, the rise in violent crime and the rise in you know, addiction, particularly with around stimulants, is something that we are going to have to take on head first and, and really push this plan of you know, community engagement, evidence-based policing, fixing the causation. Why are people getting there? Um, and then dealing with all the, the side effects of you know, crime and addiction. Mm -hmm. How do you see translating your military experience to your future mm -hmm. job as sheriff yeah. for the county? Well, let's not get too carried away about yeah. my combat experience. I'm the Air yeah. Force, so you remember I was eating a lot of ice cream in the chow hall. No, I'm just kidding. But I have a wide variety of experience. And I've worked in a little bit busier places, Claremont, Windsor, um, and so on. So the, the biggest thing that I think I bring to this is knowing when I don't know something and how to ask questions and who to ask questions from and how to find the answers, right? And going out there and going, all right, we need training. We need to, to work on these things and supporting my, my people that are out there doing this work, you know, but, but I'm going to focus on building a strong department. What I mean by strong is, is solid people that you can rely on and giving them the training and the tools that they need and then the guidance to achieve our objective, which is making Windsor County a safer and better place to live. So, again, it's not just the Air Force. You know, the Air Force did a lot of great stuff for me. Um, I, got to, I was dealing with what was called emergency management in the Air Force, and I did some intel stuff in Afghanistan. So having this just multitude of experiences and training and all these different, you know, being exposed to a lot of different things, I think will help me be a well-rounded leader. I guess this kind of answers your question. Yeah. Is there anything that you want to talk about that I, we haven't talked about? No, I think, I think we've touched on a lot. Yeah. Uh, the big thing is this is, this is going to take a budget cycle or two to get to where we need this is um you know we want to hear from you we want to we want input from the public um and just give it i think give it a chance out there if you're one of these towns that is having a debate about whether either to take on the sheriff's department or to increase your funding for us um, i think give it a chance and you're going to like what you see i think um i'm Again, I want to thank the voters in Windsor County. This was it was a pretty big deal, upsetting a, essentially a 40-year incumbent by 21 points. Um, so thank you all for the support. Uh, and even folks that, that maybe I wasn't your top choice, uh, I'm going to do everything I can to make you proud uh, as your next sheriff. So how can folks get in touch with you and keep track of, of what's going on yeah, as you transition? I think the, the best thing right now is my state email which is ryan, R-Y-A-N, dot Palmer, P-A-L-M-E-R, at Vermont, dot gov, G-O-V. So it's Vermont spelled out, ryan, dot Palmer, at Vermont, dot gov. Shoot me an email, uh, and I can guarantee you that I'll, I'll be in touch as soon as I can, and we'll, we'll figure it out from there. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much for your time thank today. You. Thank you for having me. It was a great conversation. Uh, 
and I look forward to maybe many more. Maybe we can make this a, a little series or something. Uh, you that know, would be, be great. Kind of, I'm sure kind of people interesting, would appreciate right? it. Yeah. yeah, and even a call-in show yeah. that'll be a, that'll be interesting. But yeah, if we can figure that out technologically, that I think mm. that'd be a great idea. Sounds good. Yeah, awesome. All right, thanks, thanks again. Jim. Appreciate it. Yeah.